I was a walking corpse at my peak. Yeah, on the outside, I looked better. My haircut was better. My beard was more trimmed. My muscles were bigger. My style was better. My stories were more engaging. I could make you laugh more on and on. But I was a corpse. I was a walking corpse. Internally, I was dead. I was dead. Very pleased to be joined today by Roosh V. He's gone from a fornicator to a man of faith. And this is a journey that people need to hear about. Roosh, you have described yourself looking back on your past with the line that I was a man bonded to sex. Could you explain a bit about what that really means and how you realized it? As I came of age in the United States, in the Washington, D.C. area, I decided that uh, the most important goal I could have in my life was pursuing women. I'd caught up in this pickup artist community. I was in the last year of college. I was around 21, 22. And after I graduated, I really dove, dove in. So what it means is for your life to revolve around achievement of pleasure from women. I basically made them out to be a god. Only they were capable of satisfying me, of giving me any kind of meaning in life. In a practical way, that just entailed waking up from the time I was up to the time I went to bed, obsessing over how I was going to meet this girl or if I was in a relationship secular relationship with a woman, how I was going to maintain it to maximize the rewards that I was going to get. I actually quit my job to dedicate myself full time into this by not only pursuing women through pickup, but also devoting my career to writing about it, to not only detailing the encounters I had with them in the pornographic detail of it, but trying to teach men how to do this by making a false idol out of a creature, a creature of God. But I didn't care about God then. I figured it out. I knew how to live. I knew I was doing the right thing. And look at all these men online who compliment me, who not only buy my books and fund the lifestyle I'm doing, but repeatedly say that they wish they could be like me. So I knew at that time that I was doing the right thing. I wish it came to an end sooner than it actually had. And what was your aim in writing these books, encouraging men to see women how you saw them? I thought I was doing a good deed. I thought I was helping the world by pairing men and women together in these sexual relationships. What a good man I, I was for teaching men how to pick up girls and to sleep with them. I was also earning an income from it, an income that was actually much higher than what I had as a microbiologist, which was the career that I had before. I was also able to exalt myself. Like, look how, uh, what a great man I was, what a skilled, talented, important special man I was. It isn't a gift, but that's how I saw it. And so all these things from the pride to the monetary rewards to this feeling of, I would look in the mirror and think I was a good person. I was a good person for doing this. So they kind of uh, kept me in it. And of course, by becoming an expert in the field, so to speak, I could also maximize the rewards, the pleasure rewards of meeting more girls. So I guess the whole philosophy at the time was more, more, more. Anything, just eating at a buffet of life, of all the pleasures of life. And I did that um, pretty much full time from my mid-20s to when it all came to an end around in my late 30s, when I was around 39. Nearly 20 years then. Yeah. One line from your writing that really caught my eye was, I used sex to bond with both women and men, but those bonds were weak indeed. Now, when was it that you really started to figure out how weak those bonds were? You've described the bond with men that you formed, but when did you really figure out the bonds with the women were weak? I thought that uh, when you were to have sex with someone that indicated a connection, that indicated something was there, that you were a match, 
But with the women I was with, I didn't care about them and they didn't care about me. It was easy come, easy, easy go. And the fact that we had this most uh, intimate experience that two humans can have, I think, didn't bond us in any way, started to tell me that, okay, I can't really top the pleasure. I can't top the pleasure that I'm getting out of this. So the first women I picked up in a nightclub, the pleasure I got from that was extremely high. But then years down the line, picking up a girl from the nightclub felt like a chore. I can't wait until she leaves after uh, this physical act, this mutual masturbatory act was done. I like to think I had some logic or retained some. I thought, well, if I can't maintain this pleasure high of new of new girls, how about I find that one queen, that one amazing, beautiful girl and stay with her? But how are you going to find your dream, quote unquote, dream girl when you are as broken as I was? I kept attracting girls who were as broken as me, but then I had the gall to complain about them. Why aren't they perfect? Why aren't they perfect like I was, but I was not perfect. So this kind of guys have their fun and then ease into a secular relationship that was loving and was going to, she was going to save you. That was a delusion. And so these attempts at relationships that I had ended in way more pain than I could have had uh, through the hookups I was having before. You mentioned the basis of the relationship. There's a lot of talk nowadays about the problems that incels face. You have had the interesting insight that The fornicator and incel are identical in that they are held hostage by their lust. What do you mean by that? The only difference between the incel and the fornicator is that the fornicator occasionally gets lucky and sleeps with the woman. Now, it could be due to his look, his charm, whatever, but their mind says their mentality is the same. They're obsessing over a false idol, a false god. They both, whether they get a woman in bed or not, they both think that this woman is the cure. This woman is how my life will be saved from the misery, the doldrums, my bad job. So that's why I started to figure out, you know, at the time when I was in this, I was like, wow, I'm so great because I actually get girls. And those guys who are hating on me, they're jealous because they don't get any girls. But I wasn't different than that. We were the same, just perhaps at different stages of life, but we were, we were both consumed by it. We were both burning with a desire that was just sending us deeper into the pit. And I would argue that the fornicator, he may think he's better off, but that actual um, completion of this physical bond that is not what God intended for us actually damages them much faster than the insult. You mentioned being at a different stage there. To what extent do you think that being in that mindset stops people progressing towards manhood? There's an immaturity, a spiritual immaturity to what you just described. When a man has sex on his mind and when he can actually fulfill the lustful urges he he has, that sex itself turns his mind into mush. It halts any maturity or adult development that that man can go on. You you have men who have been with countless girls, dozens of women or more, but have the maturity of a teenage boy. It seems to be that once a man or a woman starts to have sex, their maturity stops at that age. He becomes overly consumed with the flesh, with the bodily. How many men did I know who were in this game would spend more time on their appearance than a a woman? You have men who sculpt their eyebrows. Uh, You have men that are obsessed with clothing, clothing, obsessed with the gym. Nothing wrong with the gym to be healthy, to be strong, to defend your family. But they were just going there to look good in a tight shirt on Friday or Saturday nights when they would go out. Childish ideas of what life is about. And you constantly feed those childish ideas. I want this. I want that. Child doesn't know what is good for it or not. The parent says no. But unfortunately for us, when we decide to uh, meet a woman as an adult, no one tells us, hey, it's wrong. The culture tells the opposite. Yeah, that's a great idea. 
explore yourself, develop self-esteem. You know, this is what you have to do. You're an adult. Our parents tell us this. Our parents say, enjoy life. You're too young to marry. I mean, I can't be the only one whose parent said, oh, have kind of like a sow your royal oats for a while. See what's out there. See what you like. But it turns out that seeing what's out there digs a pit. Every sexual experience you have is like a a shovel going into the ground and that pit gets deeper and deeper to when one day a lot of men, they wake up in their old age, no wife, and they decide I'm just going to go to Southeast Asia and sleep with prostitutes for the rest of my life. And that's how their life ends. And this is a sad thing. Chilling words. And I want to just draw out the implications of what you said there. You've made the remark that there will be passionate efforts to solve all other problems under the sun, such as the dangers of plastic straws, before addressing the corruption of children and adults who regularly watch porn. What you were saying there paints a picture of a culture that is ordered towards leading people astray. It's difficult to find the right path. You found it the hard way. What's going on here if even parents aren't telling children what they need to hear? Certainly not the schools. We are not going to understand any of this unless we account for the spiritual element. If we only account for the material element of what's going on, what we can see, it's not going to make any sense. It's not why would the government want to not create healthy families that can whatever pay taxes and support the state and you know breed moral people why wouldn't the government want to abide by the natural order the moral order to create a healthy society for everyone it, it doesn't make sense why they would do this but once you start accounting for the fact that satan the enemy of mankind hates god and attacks us to get to to spite god and this war has been going on since Adam and Eve. And so once you account for the spiritual element of Satan and his demons trying to hurdle us into hell through sin by going against the commandments of God, what Christ gave us, then it makes some more sense. It's actually logical. We're in the middle. You have God on one side and Satan and his henchmen on the other. We are in the middle uh, where this spiritual battle is unfolding. And it's been unfolding, and it seems to be arriving at a late stage. And I see my life as being caught up in deception, being caught up in desires of what the fallen body wants to uh, do, and being caught up in the temptations and the bad ideas that Satan has put into me. You know, one thing I can tell you, it was a little bit easier to write when I was writing the pickup stuff. I was getting a lot of help. Because Satan wanted me to do that. I was actually helping him. I didn't know it at the time. But it was easier for me to write this really sinful, damaging, how to get laid content. But now when I want to write more positive topics, oh, man, I'm sitting at the screen. I'm like, oh, if we don't understand the spiritual element to it, we will think all these horrible thoughts and instincts in our mind are from us. It's not from us. A lot of it is not. That's not me. That's not who I am. I'm not my thoughts. I'm not this urge. What science says that that's what a man is supposed to do kind of makes women pregnant, but doesn't take care of them. Yeah. How is society going to end up if we do that? Accounting for the spiritual reality is important, but you see it. Most people don't want to deal with that. The, the deepest conflict, the deepest spiritual battle is in the human heart. I think in modern culture, there's an increasing tendency to try to see it as being out there somehow, whether it's people of a different race who are the oppressors or the opposite sex or some problem that isn't in ourselves. But you seem to have lived this conflict internally. When you don't understand what the spiritual reality is, your spiritual eyes are not open enough. And what you do, what your life becomes ab about is to feed the desires of the flesh, whatever your body wants. Your body wants to feel angry at people because it thinks it's better. It wants to feel prideful that it's better than it thinks it is. It wants to feel good and it wants to feel comfortable too. It doesn't want to endure any difficulty. 
Uh, so it's really the body is in control, but we're made of both body and soul. If you feed your body only, you subvert your soul. And while you make it very hard after you die, when all judged after we die, our soul does, does not die. If you feed only your body, well, your soul is going to be crying out in pain. You're going to have to silence the conscious. The evil you do grows and grows. So the point of leading a spiritual life is to put the soul on top. The soul should be in charge. Now, that's very difficult. That's something that I'm trying to do, and it's a process. But I think that's what I would say the difference of a lot of men who are involved in pickup or Tinder. They want to meet girls. They're into masturbation, pornography. They're putting their body at the top where they're going to pay for that. You know, they are, they are going to pay, you know, the wages of sin is death. You, you have to pay, pay now when you're in the body, ask forgiveness from God in the body, because once you're dead, time is up. How do you reach a man like that? I achieve heights that you won't from doing that. And it was wrong and I don't do it anymore. And if the people don't want to listen to me, and unfortunately a lot don't, they're going to, they want to learn the hard way. I hope that God gives you the opportunity to change your ways. You get caught in sin so badly that you're the guy who flies to Southeast Asia to live your last days there. What's going to happen to you? You took it to lengths that most people never will. And it gave you insights into it. People won't ever have. And now you're here to share them. Now you've got a really interesting comment about guilt here that I'd like you to expand on. You say that the women who cry most about toxic masculinity or rape culture and who believe that sex is a source of empowerment and confidence are promiscuous or polyamorous women who are relieving their guilt. Tell me a bit more about your own sense of guilt and what you mean by that. When I was, say, sleeping with a lot of girls, I would sleep with them at night and then the next day i would write an article for the blog that i had complaining about them complaining and complaining i was always angry always angry the smallest things would set me off i would have temper tantrums you know if i bought a, be a beverage for a girl in a bar and then she took that beverage and didn't want to talk to me anymore i would be furious so how can it be that i was receiving all this pleasure from women but at the same time i was so deeply angry unhappy and miserable the pleasure was supposed to make happier so what i think was actually going on was that that anger was a channeling of the guilt that i felt from uniting in one flesh with these girls who i never loved and never intended to marry so when you see all the women who are complaining about, oh, I don't know, rape culture and people who say abortion should be illegal and men are toxic, men are sexist, men are this. Well, to me, that looks like exactly like what I did, that they're participating in sin again and again. They're feeling guilty. They're not in the church. So the guilt stays. It gets darker and darker. And then here they come you know, latching on to the feminist movement or whatever they're doing now. You mentioned abortion there. How do you think all this relates to population reduction? There's also inherently sterile sex being promoted. There's a link here, isn't there? The wealthy needed population increases for people to work in the factories and so on. So they would usually promote some semblance of nuclear family, but something happened, something happened. And what happened was these neo-Malthusian ideas started to take hold among the elite and they became deathly afraid of overpopulation. The world, we're going to run out of food. And the Club of Rome, one of these elite organizations was created specifically to address that. So something happened in the 1960s, a great shift in the world culture, where you had the sexual revolution take a reproductive act between a husband and a wife to between anybody, man or woman, yes, but soon it became man and man and woman and woman. Then a lot of bad ideas started to come forth. The legalization of abortion, the legalization of contraceptive in the entertainment and media 
of kind of non-traditional families. I remember the show Murphy's Brown. I was a child. And the big news was that she had a child out of wedlock. And this was big news. So you can see what they were doing. So they started to say, you know what? We don't need this population. We don't need this high population to increase our wealth because we're moving from factory industry robotics to artificial intelligence. So they, I believe, are trying to ride the wave down, ride the population down. How are we going to do that? Well, we can't just go kill them all because once they see us killing them with guns or bombs, they're going to come after us. So we need to do this in a really crafty way. And I believe their crafty way involves innumerable social engineering schemes to decrease the population. But now, unfortunately, I think there's medical ways to achieve that goal, too. So I think Recreational sex was a ingeniously evil way to reduce the population without anyone knowing that. And while at the same time, those who are being targeted for sterilization to think, I am getting something out of this. Look, I can sleep with anyone I want. My grandfather couldn't do that. I actually would think, man, I have probably more sex partners than all my grandfathers and my father and all of them. Man, I'm such a stud. But by just having that thought and not recognizing it as a loss, man, how severely I fell for that scheme. There's a story in the Bible of, in the Old Testament, King David's daughter, Tamar, getting raped by her brother. She was a virgin. She got raped by her brother, and the Bible describes her absolutely crushed. Her womanly happiness was gone forever and how sad she was. Now, look at what we have, where a woman celebrates when she has a new sex partner, loses her virginity, was stage one. Group sex, who knows what they're doing? I don't even want to know now (laughs) because times are changing, even from when I was doing it not that long ago. But now you have the women say, yeah, I slept with a man. That's a good thing. I slept with 20 men. And listen, if there's something happening that has a population reducing effect, I can assure you that's not spontaneous. <laughs> that's not an accident. And if you are participating in this population reducing scheme, whether it's masturbation to porn or hooking up with girls, I have some bad news. You were tricked. You were tricked. You thought that it's serving you, but you were tricked. You're just a tool of the elites. And it took me a a long time to understand that. I thought, no, I'm the king. I'm the king because I can get sex whenever I want. But I was a slave the entire time. And it took me almost 20 years to open my eyes to that fact. You mentioned the agenda there. And you say that there's a coordination between the media, government, and academia to program citizens to abandon their innate strengths for imagined ideas of utopia. And as we've seen throughout history, all these attempts to bring heaven down to earth only end up raising hell in the long run. What are the innate strengths that you feel people are abandoning? And exactly what is this imagined utopia? Is it just a utopia of easy pleasure? Humans can invent a reason for our existence depending on the age, depending on the times. A lot of people today think that I can pick any gender that I want. I can live as I want. I can merge with the metaverse. I can take whatever vaccines to live a long time, on and on. I mean, there's all these ideas, but what is true? All truth comes from God. And what does God want us to do? He wants us to serve him. Now, there's ways to serve him. As a man, you get married and you serve your wife and kids. Woman was made out of the rib of man, whether you believe that in literal or metaphorical sense, it is true. And so a woman must serve the man, then the family home, and both the woman and the man, husband and wife, unite in one flesh to create a little church of their home and serve God and have their souls both saved. That's the point. Now, of course, God has allowed men to be stronger, to be natural 
leaders to be more logical. He's allowed women to be more social, better geared for raising children and so on. If we can just abide by the natural law, I think the blessings we receive from God will be great. We don't abide by the moral law. Definitely, we don't abide by the Christian commandments. We abide by nothing, or at least I didn't. So what blessings will you get from that? So no, you will just get the misery and the pain. You will complain and rant all day long. And so heaven is completely blocked off. So when Adam and Eve got kicked out of paradise, you had an angel guard paradise, cherubim guard paradise with a flaming sword. So what do you have now? You have people that think they can approach that angel with the sword and crash into paradise through what? Because they they think that they have the strength or the power to, because they created a new transhumanist scheme because the AI can now do this or that. Well, it's nonsense. From the Tower of Babel onward, they've tried this. They've tried to reach heaven without God, and it fails every single time. You can't do it. So that's what I try to do. I try to achieve a sexual heaven, so to speak, and it was death. I was, I I can't explain to you now that my eyes have been opened. The scales have fallen. I was a walking corpse at my peak. Yeah, on the outside, I looked better. My haircut was better. My beard was more trimmed. My muscles were bigger. My style was better. My stories were more engaging. I could make you laugh more, on and on. But I was a corpse. I was a walking corpse. Externally, I was pleasing the world, pleasing the women. Internally, I was dead. I was dead. Now it's kind of, I hope it's flipped internally. I am alive. The grace of God uniting with him day by day. Externally, I'm a washed up has been. I'm, I'm, I can tell you not many girls look at this, which is fine. You know, the muscles I have, I'm not as strong as I was. I'm getting older. That's fine. Outside. Yeah. I'm, I look to the world as a nobody. A has been, but internally, thank God, you know, I am alive in a way that I never have been. Well, it's good to hear that you are finding yourself again in that way. You say that confidence and self love have become false gods in the West. But after your journey, you found that that was the wrong way to pursue confidence, and you're regaining confidence now in a way that you didn't expect back then as totally a nonsense idea. It's really confidence for nothing that you have done. Feeling special for merely existing. You are a creature of God. Why should you? God should get the confidence out of that. God made you. You didn't make yourself women who uh, you know can get attention from men. Did you make your face? Did you make your hair? How can we receive confidence for what we did not do. That's delusion. And unfortunately, most people receive confidence for the evil acts that they do. I receive confidence for purely evil acts. So this tells me that, hey, having confidence is demonic. You know, I'm in the Orthodox Church, and pride is something that is actively talked about by the church and the elders. We have to be humble. Christ taught us that. There's a reason. There's a reason. Christ taught us to be humble, because if not, we would fall into deep sin and lose our souls. It's not because he is a he's a bad God and he wants us to not feel confident. It's because this confidence is false. This self-esteem is false. And if we really feel confident in who we think we are, that's really a deception to get us to commit sin on top of sin. We'll lose our souls if we don't follow what God tells us. He didn't give us the commandments for his own good. He gave us the commandments for our own good. So it's no surprise that at the height of the sin I was doing, I just went against all of them. It can be difficult to get a message like that out to people. You had that great description earlier of how it was easier for you to write your pickup books than it is now creatively for you to produce your new content. You've been kicked off some social media platforms and you say that free speech is important from the perspective that concerned men or women, 
should be able to speak out once they have identified corruption and degeneracy in their societies. It's easier to promote the degeneracy than to speak out against it, though. Why is that? I think that says something about the times and says something about those who rule, who rule over us. You know, the point of, the, of a government, many people could argue this, but a point of the government is to protect the people, to protect the people from harm and moral dysfunction. I would say if we had a godly king, uh, his, his goal would be to steward, help steward with his power, our souls into paradise. But now everything is inverted. It seems to me the point of our institutions that we've come to trust and the point of our governments is to amplify our sins, to amplify our sins and hurdle us to hell. You know, when Christ, once he was baptized in the Jordan by St. John the Forerunner and Satan, he tempted him. And what was one of the things that Satan did? He took him up to the mountains and he showed Christ all the kingdoms of the world and told Christ that these I will, I will give you if you listen to me. Now, so what does that say? That says that Satan is the prince of this world, that he controls the minds and hearts of the kings, of the presidents now. So all the countries, unfortunately, especially as we get towards the end of human history, are controlled by Satan. So if, say, I'm in the USA, this government is evil government. It's an evil government. I mean, I can say that without any hesitation. Some of the local governments are fine, but the federal government, it's an evil government. A lot of corruption, a lot of cover-ups of heinous crimes. So what if Satan controls that uh, government, he's going to organize the government in a way to amplify my fallen nature to commit as many sins as I can so he can take my soul after the death of my body. So this is why it's very, it's kind of easy now to learn what the truth is. If it's on the news, just do the opposite. <laughs> you know, if the, if the president says it, do the opposite. It's not bad. It's not bad. You know, we were all made in the image of God. So even someone who doesn't worship God directly is still capable of good deeds is still capable of telling the truth, but times are getting to such a bad place that it seems like humans are intent on becoming just like the demons. And it's, I, cause I look at my own behavior in the past as something like this. Um, you know, a lot of people, they're, they're very kind to me and they say, Oh, Rush, well, you know, your work wasn't all that bad. It helped. I'm sure it helped the guy find a, find a wife, but you only saw the things that I showed too. I mean, just the internal, how my mind, how I worked, how I operated was just very bad. It was very bad. I mean, this is how my, why I was, when God opened my eyes, I was able to turn away from it because I realized, well, thanks, thanks to God, how bad, it, how bad it was. So you can imagine my disappointment when some people attack me saying, you are wrong. Sex is the way. What can you say to those people? I don't know. But, you know, I think as a Christian, we have to pray for those who are not yet in the church or not on the right path. But this is a war that's been going on for a long time. I doubt we're the last ones. There'll be people after us, and this war will continue to go on. But if we can find the truth, and we know that truth is from God, I say, well, that's fine to have the truth. But how about we go to the source of it? And once you go to the source of it, then that's, I think, when your life can really make a positive change. The upside to the climate today is that because we're spiritual creatures, people can sense that there's a darkness. You see this in Dostoevsky's novels. It might not be that an argument from supernatural goodness convinces someone of the existence of God, but if people have a sense of real evil or real darkness, then that can shake them out of a materialistic worldview. And in a way, it sounds like you experienced that yourself. You knew something was profoundly wrong and there's hope there for people. It's a bit like in the divine comedy when the ascent to heaven begins out of Satan's backside, you reach the lowest point 
and then you can climb from there. Before I started to reach to the spiritual world of God and the angels and demons and so on, I thought that evil didn't really exist. It was just, uh, we're just random atoms colliding in meat space. You know, things would happen, coincidences, and on and on. I mean, sometimes people did bad and sometimes people did did uh, good, but there wasn't any pattern. It was just random movements. But then I think once the gay marriage agenda started to ramp up and how they were uh, talking about gays adopting children and things like that, I started to think this is objectively evil. Objectively. There's no randomness to it. And why does it seem to be that those with power are pushing the most objectively evil agendas? It's it's not an accident. I was like, now I can't, I no longer, even though my mind was mush because of the sexual activity I was doing, I said, I can't ignore this. This is something is going on. This isn't just people being people anymore. This is a concerted push over the years to hurt children, especially once the transgender issue started to happen. I do remember one of the turning points for me was a National Geographic magazine cover. And I remember as a kid, National Geographic was, yeah, go to the mountains or take pictures of animals, indigenous tribes. On the cover, uh, they had a picture of a boy dressed up as a girl and the article went on to promote transgenderism. And I thought, that's evil. <laughs> so, okay, if there is a pattern to evil, and if there's objective evil, there must be objective good. If there's objective good, who is behind that good? And then so you start to reach out. You start to ask questions that you never asked. And you start to examine yourself. What am I doing? Am I doing good or not? And, you know, I think God, he loves everyone. He tries to reach everyone, you know, just a little drop of truth, the little baby food here or there until he gives you a spoon that's big. And you're like, whoa, this is food I've never had before. And I think that's what happened to me and what happens to a lot of other people who come to God, not through his goodness, but through what Satan and his demons do. A painful way to go about it, but there's a lot in your writing about the importance of accepting pain and suffering. Tell me a bit more about that. You have the line that as a Christian, I am called to pick up my cross and carry it, not seek heaven on this earth. So I would not mind constant tribulation as long as I'm able to bear it in a way that does not sacrifice my salvation. People are encouraged to seek comfort above all else nowadays, mostly, aren't they? In the United States, the two biggest idols, physical health and comfort. And that's one thing that I was obsessed about. I believe that my Lord and God, Jesus Christ, he made me. He made me from the dust. And he said, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. And I love my God. And this is a process. I'm trying to love him more and more and love less things of the world. But he said, we can live in the world, but we are not of the world. We are not a son of this world. If we're a son of the world, if we listen to the flesh, then we're a son of Satan. So God told, he instructed me, he instructed all of us how to live so that our souls may be saved for our own good. Cause he doesn't need us. God doesn't need us. He didn't make us cause he was taught bored in heaven and wanted some, some entertainment. He made us cause he wants us to feel his love. So God said, you know, God instructed us to pick up and carry our cross every day. It's not just once in a while. And the way he lived is a role model. The way he's, Saints have lived. They've endured pain. And the reason is because if we don't endure pain and suffering, we will forget about God. We will want to experience pleasures of the flesh, the comforts of the flesh. It's only when we are in pain, when we're in poverty, that we at least have the mental 
awareness that there is a God, that this life is not all. This life is not it. Just endure this pain. Keep your eyes and your heart on God to live with him for eternity in the next life. So it's really the suffering and the pain. Why do we suffer? Because God loves us. Because without that pain, we would forget about him. We would neglect our duty to serve him. We would not follow the commandments and our souls will be condemned. So it's weird. It's weird to explain that to people. I lost my daughter. I lost my son at a young age. God isn't fair. It's not right. No, you lo- you had to lose him because if you didn't, you would get so caught up in the world and things of the world and comforts that you may lose your soul. You mentioned where people keep their eyes and their heart, and there are all kinds of distractions clamoring for the attention of our eyes and our hearts. You say that a man's spiritual state will match what he subjects his eyes and ears to. If he consumes mindless TikTok and hip hop videos, we know where his heart lies. What kind of advice would you give to people who feel they're becoming addicted to those elements of technological culture that are so difficult to avoid? Now, one thing I have to state is that our human willpower is pathetically weak. We don't have much power and strength. We have much less than we think. And all the power we think we have is really power to commit a sin. I remember in my old days when I wanted to quit coffee, I really tried hard to quit coffee. And I remember, I think I quit for a month and then usually I would ease back into it. So my own power was such that I couldn't quit coffee as a grown man on my own strength when I thought I was a masculine man because I could sleep with girls. I couldn't even quit coffee. And of course, at that time, I was consuming alcohol and girls, pornography, and on and on. One thing I can say is that with God's help, quitting coffee or quitting alcohol, it's very easy. I've quit things. Uh, My sexual addiction was a hundred times greater than coffee. And with God's help, by leaning on him, I've been able, thank God so far, to quit that. And I've turned away from that, even though I was a teacher, a guru of that. You can't explain that. I know my strength. I can't even quit coffee. How can I quit my life obsession that I was completely, wholly addicted to? So for those who are struggling, I can tell you life hacks and tips like that are not going to work. Yes, it's important to remove the access from it, uninstall the apps or you know, block this or block that. That's fine. But the urge is still going to be there. So really, you have to be healed from the inside out. And you have to ask God. I was very surprised to find that if you ask God something and it's his will, he grants it to you just like that, just like that. And um, the lives of the saints, it, it shows that. I mean, it's true. It's true. God can grant anything, but he's not going to grant you something that um, hurts you. If you ask him for a billion dollars and that billion dollars is going to get you addicted to drugs and so on, he's not going to give that to you. Even if you are sick and you ask God, please make me well. Well, if making you well right now will increase your pride, and hurt your soul, he's not going to grant that either. But he wants us to ask, the Bible says, we have to persist, ask him again and again. And if it serves his will, he's going to give it to you in a manner that makes it clear that he's doing it. Not you are doing it, you pathetic human being. You are weak, but he is doing it. I hope everyone gets to experience this. It's a beautiful thing. One thing you see in the uh, culture is these messages that say you are loved, you know, loved by who? I don't know. But the truth is God, he loves you. He loves you more than anyone. He loves you more than your mother and your father. You can't imagine it. And for some of us, he shows his love. And I believe I've experienced that. And there's no need for me to go on line for these, uh, you know, non-Christian content. It's just a waste of time. How, how can I take God's love and be entertained now? You know, so I try to replace all the secular content. And, you know, sometimes I do follow the news, 
But even the news now, I'm thinking, well, why am I spending my time onto this? I could be listening to a sermon or the audio Bible or something else. But I think the, the more you show God that you want his help, the more he's going to show you himself. And the more he shows you himself, the faster your faith grows, the deeper your love for him grows. And guess what? When you love God, you also love the creatures of God. And that includes everyone else. That includes all the animals, human beings. Um, so I think by sharing my faith, I hope to see that there's much better out there than a very imperfect love, if you want to call it. It's more of a lust of a woman that you hook up with. You're not going to be happy with her. Who are you going to be happier with? The love from the God that created you or the love of a woman who wants to commit sin? Get married with a church husband and wife. That love is great. But the love of God is always going to be the strongest love. And we should all pursue that love. So you spent many years of your life advising men on how to pick up women. What would Rushvi today say? First, build a healthy relationship with God to the extent where you're talking to him each day and you can ask him, ask him, God, who do you want me to marry? Who do you, how do you want me to go about this? But the second thing, I mean, just to add a practical side of it is I don't advise to pick up girls, to go up to random girls. That's dumb to me. Now, of course, you're always going to hear stories. Well, I found my wife that way and I love her and we have 10 kids. Okay, that's that's great. But for most people, the best way to meet someone is either in church or through your friends at that church. Don't get enamored by the looks of a woman. Oh, she's beautiful. I mean, that's just external. I think her faith, her maturity, her values are more important than how she looks. Because in a marriage that lasts, that look is going to fade. You'll, you'll get adapted to it. Um, one thing is in church, it's, uh, you know, I, I am in a church where there's a good amount of people that come, maybe over 100 people. And uh, for the younger men anyway, I think I'm... <laughs> I'm at an age where I'm not as in demand, let's say, but for the younger men, there's some options there. And I tell them, well, let's first feel things out. Ask her brother first. Let's ask her friend. Is she leaving thinking of dating a guy? Let's not play the secular game because it's very tempting to, oh, I see a good girl in a good looking girl in church. I'm going to go walk up to her and talk to her and get her number. Well, that's what the secular people do. If you want to build, if you want to start building a fleeting relationship yes but the better way is to be a part of a community you know be a part of a community ask around to avoid potential embarrassment also to avoid becoming jaded you go up to that cute girl in church and she says i have a boyfriend and then later you see her with another guy you're not going to feel good well let's be patient let's be a part of a church week after week you know you don't have to pick up you don't have to worry about that you don't have to worry about game your game is God now. God is going to move your lips. If God wants you to marry a woman, don't you think he's going to enlighten you with how to do it? You don't need me or a guru anymore. You have God, and God is going to help you do that. Interesting. You say talk to the brother, talk to the family. Moving away from that atomistic, lonely encounter that you used to recommend. I've seen it done. I've seen it. You know, there was a uh, one guy I knew, he was going to go ask a girl in the church out on a date. He's, I'm going to go up to her. You know, he's, and I can see what was going through him. He was getting a little bit puffed up, trying to build the confidence to do this. And I'm like, wait, wait, her brother is here. Ask him. And at first the man was like, no, oh, I don't, you know, I can tell he didn't want to do it because his will is to ask the girl. So I don't want to reveal too much because everyone knows what church that I go to, but he did the right thing. So he asked the brother first, the brother gave the green light and let's just say the outcome wasn't bad. So, but the problem is this, let's say like me, if I wanted to date a girl, I would want to ask maybe her brother or her dad, but how about if her dad isn't in the church Her brother doesn't care? You know, unfortunately, a lot of boomer dads are whatever makes my son or my daughter happy. I don't care. You know, it's like suddenly parents don't give guidance anymore. So what's the point of having a dad if you're not going to give a guidance? So parents, they don't want to give guidance anymore. Whoever their daughter wants to bring home, that's fine. 
I trust her. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I mean, no, no parent should trust their kid to do the right thing. If you have more experience and more spiritual experience anyway. So that's how it should be. Now, if you have a church like mine, that there's a good amount of people, maybe you have a chance at that. But how about if you don't? How about if your church is only old ladies? Well, look, God is your relationship with God is more important. So stay in, if the church is good, if it's saving your soul, you should stay in it, even if there are no good looking girls and just ask God, you don't think that God can put a girl in front of you that he wants you to marry. You don't think that if God, he made us from the dust, he could cross my path with a girl that he wants me to marry. So it's kind of one thing I've found is that the stronger the faith a man has, the less he's concerned about it. It's really the men who don't have any faith, who are really concerned, who are really worried about it. How am I going to meet a girl? How am I going to do this? It's like, calm down. You don't have a, a girl problem. You have a faith problem. Build your faith. Then you're not going, then you're going to be as, you can be as old as me, all this white hair and not be concerned about it. You don't have to worry. You're in God's hand. What? He's going to let you unnecessarily go without something that you need to save your soul. That's nonsense. The comment about boomer dads there was really interesting and the uh, failure of masculine leadership that you would expect children not being given any direction. You've got a interesting worry that men of the future will not even be able to research what masculinity is or come to understand how their nature is being undermined. What can we do about this? Unfortunately, I think what you're going to have is most of the population are just given up to the modern times. And what the modern times demands is this woke ideology, transhumanism, sex on demand, a boy is a girl, a girl is a boy. It's just that's that part of society will stay. They're not going to be cured. But you're going to have a remnant. I don't think it's going to be that large. Uh, you're going to have a remnant of people that you look at them and how they live. And it's going to be like looking into a time machine back hundreds or thousands of years ago. They're just going to be doing it the way that God instructed us to. You're going to see stay-at-home moms with seven children and their dads. And as soon as a daughter turns 18, she gets married off to one of the good men, the good boys, or what have you, in the church. And they grow their own food and they worship God. That, I can tell you, exists. I have seen it. But when I was in my player phase, I thought, no, it's done. We're all moderners now. There's none of that virgin before you marry. No, that's over. That stopped a long time ago. I was wrong. No, there are many Orthodox families, people doing this. And it's only reason I didn't see it is because my eyes were completely blind. But now I can see what's happening. And it's a wonderful thing. But to be honest, to ask you, how many people with all the entertainment options and the pleasure options and the tasty engineered food with the soybean oil and all the comfort and the gadgets and the mute nonstop music, all the music I want, all the podcasts I want, all the Netflix movies I want. How many people in, with that flood of options are going to say, I don't want any of that. I'm going to choose to go to church and stand for three hours to pray. <laughs> Or I'm going to fast in the Orthodox Church half of the calendar year. We can't eat meat and dairy. I'm going to pray. I'm going to stand in my prayer corner for an hour a night or half an hour a night and pray. How many people are going to do that? What percentage is going to do what we should do? You know, when Christ came, he didn't say, just do this for a little while. And then once technology starts to ramp up, you don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> he didn't say, this is for the monks only. No, no, this is for all of us, even today. How many, what percentage of people are going to do that? Well, I'll tell you from what I've seen, that percentage is going to be very small. In the, of course, depends on the country, but in the United States, I'd be surprised if uh, more than 10% of the population really want to take that path, want to, you know, Christ told us he chose us out of the world, that 10% that want to live away from the world and to live as he taught us. So 
I'm not optimistic there. I am not. I don't know how we can be. I, I think as you see where the world's going, it's hard to be optimistic. Yeah. If you look at the lengths that the Amish have to go to, for example, to withstand the onslaught, you wonder, do people really want to do that? The root of all this is interesting to contemplate. You say that you think that the revolutionaries today want to destroy for the sake of destruction, because that is the only way to synchronize their darkened souls with the environment. Do you think that's what we're seeing? So I think the men at the very top, they have a plan, a feeling of power, a feeling of strength, a feeling that they're making a difference, even though the difference is bad. So those at the bottom, the useful idiots who are expendable to the, the powerful, those at the bottom, they're just living in complete chaos. They're just going after a rush of dopamine. Like I made that person put on a face mask in the store. I yelled at him and he, and he did it. Or I made the white person not go in the store because you know of the privilege that he has or on and on those with money and power they like to keep that money and power those who don't those at the bottom think that by attacking others they'll somehow gain what they've always wanted i mean there was talk of these black lives matter protests that were happening in the united states an idea that was hey this is a great place to meet girls and do things with them because most of the, the protesters, most of them are women, you know? So it's just this concept of, I want to commit a sin <laughs> in any way, shape or form. The sin has to take place. I mean, if you look at the lives of those who think that this latest and more improved revolutionary movement is going to make me happy, you'll see that their lives are very empty. You try to tell them what the truth of the matter is, and they attack you. So I can't have a conversation with them. They don't want to have a conversation with you. They may even say the time for talk is is over. We're not going to tolerate this anymore. Okay, so what are you going to do, kill me? With conversation, especially with your concerns about free speech and online censorship, what do you feel is the future of like-minded people being able to connect online or otherwise you say you feel like a fool for spending so many years building up internet domains and platforms that are scheduled for vaporization. I think it's clear that the trend online is greater levels of censorship and control. You know, I have I had my YouTube banned a while ago, and more and more friends I know say who have a YouTube, they're getting banned. So you move to the platforms, the alternative platforms. Okay. But you notice that your audience is every hit is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the way you have to see it is yes, the internet is good, but once that internet goes offline in whether they cut it off or something happens, power goes out. A lot of people don't understand without power, you can't do anything. That's the easiest way to hurt someone anyway the communities offline are going to have to be the most important do you you spend hours online talking to someone but do you know the man who lives to your right to the house to the right to house across the street because when times get bad your online buddy is going to be gone but the man you live next to now you're going to have to depend on him and he's going to have to depend on you so I think, yes, you're going to have to, this is why you're seeing a, a rise of these intentional Christian communities. But that's easier said than said than done. I'm in an apartment in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And to go from here to an intentional community where I'm growing my own cows, I mean, that seems like a, a lot of steps. <laughs> so, But at some point, we're going to have to say, yes, it's good to connect to people online, especially since online is so easy to find people who share the exact views that you have. But don't neglect the offline too. You know, Don't think that, okay, because I have a Walmart close to me, I'm set. <laughs> it's, it's tough. You know, I don't have, I'm not in a place to really say much about this because I don't have that. I don't have what I know I'm going to need. But if you have, if you don't have what you think you need, then you're just going to have to put it into God's hands. You know, I, I trust in God. He'll give me a challenge that in the end won't hurt my soul. So I'm not going to worry about it. 
it's really good advice to connect with people offline. I like the idea of knowing 10 guys within 10 minutes of where you live. Something like that is sensible, I think. Look, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. I think it's a fascinating story that sadly not enough people know about and there's so much truth in it. So it's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Great. And thank you very much for having me on. Welcome.